What's some of the um, changes that you've seen in the shoreline, the erosion, and what was the difference between when you was a young kid and how the, how the lake changed now? Well, when I was your age, Our voices are the collaborations of our minds and body. They are projections of our intangible and physical selves. Voices help us reach where we cannot touch, smell, taste, or see. When people speak or sing, no matter what words we use, the intonation, accent, resonance, sound, and register of our voices tell the stories of our journey through life. The complexity of human need, want, desire, and experience could not be expressed without language, and language would not have come to be without voice. We learn most effectively from our experiences. The lessons our senses have taught us as we navigate the world. It is one thing to be told a fact or to read it on paper. But it's another entirely to have personal experience. Or to see and hear the emotions of others in the midst of recounting their own unique story. The Louisiana Sea Grant Coastal Change Oral Histories Project aimed to raise awareness of climate change in the youth of southern Louisiana communities where the land is being eaten away by subsidence, sea level rise, and erosion at a devastating rate. The goal was to promote stewardship by putting students in direct contact with peoples who have personally felt the land of their homes slipping through their fingers. Four teachers from different at-risk areas were selected for the project. Louisiana Sea Grant trained the teachers of Holy Cross School in Orleans Parish, South Cameron High School in Cameron Parish, Thibodeau High School in Lafouche Parish, and West St. Mary School in St. Mary Parish in the best practices of interviewing and in the use of audio and visual recording equipment. Approximately 30 students participated in total, and Louisiana Sea Grant trained them in the same subject areas as their teachers. The teachers then let their students loose in their communities to unearth the life stories of interviewees and discover how the peoples of their hometowns have been affected by the sinking and eroding land on which they live. The students collected 19 total interviews over one school year. 
The interviews were then transcribed, processed, and archived for future use and access by researchers at the T. Harry Williams Center for Oral History. The stories collected are invaluable thanks to the perseverance, passion, and dedication of these students and their teachers. There are many factors that can impede the interviewing process, whether you are a novice or a professional, and the students faced many of these issues head on. Some interviews were only audio recorded, some were recorded on video as well as audio. Before we get to the actual interviews collected in the Louisiana Sea Grant Coastal Change Oral Histories Project, the following are some examples of issues that may be encountered during the interviewing okay. process. Keep in mind, oh, God. oral history is not as easy as it looks. What activities do y'all do? Yeah. Sleep. Have, have you noticed any change in climate from whenever you were younger now? Yeah. Whenever you moved here? Fine. No. Where is the coastline now compared to where it was whenever y'all first moved here? By the water. Has the coastline moved further inward uh, since you moved here? Yeah, I think so. I don't really observe that much. Alright, let's sit down. Don't move the chair. Don't move the chair. What's your name? Okay, it's stopped. You know what date? What's today's date? You gotta read all of this off? Yeah, I have to read it. Yeah, he's gonna. Now, I'm not supposed to be in the video, so don't catch me. All you're gonna do is catch him. So just wait. Because. Yeah. Well, no, he's got. The camera's gotta be on him. Yeah, and I have to read this. That was a lot of fun. Okay. Um, if Pontchartrain Beach was to still exist today, what do you think the. How, how far in do you think the shore would be? How, how do you think the. Evolution of the, of the lake would have affected the, the park? Sure what you mean. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get started. Well, today I'm here to ask you a couple, like uh, some questions. All right. Well, when I was little, we had gravel roads. The cane fields were, the st were still the same, but the uh, the what? You don't know. We had uh, plenty of you know, uh, fireflies. We called them was, uh, lightning bugs. And we used to catch, go out and play in the yard at night and catch them in jars so that we could watch them. I mean, my family, when, since they came here from France and Nova Scotia, that's all I've done is hunt and fish, you know, commercially. And <clears throat> you want to be able to get that passed on. Harry Rosenson and my alligator skins are shipped to France and Italy overseas on consignment to make purses for ladies and bags. And but you're everything to me. They were really weird. Can you stop? <laughs> Still, you know what I was doing? Like a, this wasn't even like an interview. three students, three very, very diverse students, I mean, from one end to the other, and uh, I wanted them just to experience what they could through the interviews and what they could gather from listening to actual people speak and not learn about the said environment of our area, 
through books or through regular lessons. I wanted them to learn from experiences that other people had had. And it, it turned out very well. In the beginning, they thought of this, you know, this is where we live and, you know, okay, this is where we live. But at the end, they wanted to make a statement of, this is where we live. Y'all need to pay attention. We're important. And it was like, whoa, I didn't expect that. Reading out of a book or talking or writing or whatever was not going to get them as involved and engaged in the love for their own community as what this turned out to do. So, And they did the work. I didn't have to do anything. That was the cool part. I just had to get them involved and make sure that they were going on the right track and just kind of, you know, ruffle their feathers when they weren't moving fast enough or whatever. But as far as the interviews, they loved it. I mean, totally loved it. So they learned from a new aspect, and that was, I guess, the best part because they got to shine and pick up new things and to where they're, the two that are going to college now know the value of just talking to somebody and, and listening where, you know, they're, we're not very good listeners as general people. <laughs> so I think that, you know, a new way of learning. They got to shine from a different point of view, a love for their community that they had been taking for granted. So I think that was the best part about it. You know, as far as having the oral histories there, it's documented. And there's not much from this side of, you know, of Louisiana that is documented. I think without the project, these kids would have let some very, very precious memories of their family and their community slip by. Um, we had alternates that would come into the class and go, wow, this is kind of cool because it was a very laid back environment. And uh, a lot of joking and a lot of camaraderie and a lot of teamwork. And they were like, man, I got to have this class. And then the kids would take and drop down the transcript that they had typed that was 20 or 30 pages long. And the kids would, that were like, I want to be involved in this class, they were like, let me, let me, let me retract that. Um, because they even realized how massive it was. And that was kind of cool too because it, it, it let my students see that they were, they were accomplishing something that they had never thought they could be capable of. And not only did they think it was a huge project, their fellows thought it was a huge project. And I think that built a lot of self-confidence in just them. So family, community, uh, memories, um, camaraderie, teamwork, and, and just a, self, a, a sense of accomplishment of a very, very big, a, a, not big, a massive task. You can educate the people, starting with our children, because when they live here, they're, they're voters. If we don't teach them what we need to vote for and what does that mean and what is happening with climate, because climate's going to affect us dramatically. I mean, you can just listen to the stories and see how it has affected us, but it's going to continue to affect us. And if our students don't understand what that means and what kind of laws need to be enacted to protect us, or not even a law can necessarily stop it. We might not be able to do anything to stop it. They need to know for themselves where to put their future and where to put their love and to appreciate what we have while we have it before it's too late. And to document and you know to, to be able to keep those records. And the trees are gone and really the only thing that's there is the, is the marsh grass and um, the loss of, uh, of waterfowl, the loss of uh, mammals. Uh, just because the environment has changed so drastically. So yeah, I think I got my eyes opened a little bit. I knew about it, but you know, to hear the stories, you know, that, that, that's where it really kind of brings it home. And I think the kids were a little bit surprised also. In the class, it was like, you know, if this continues, you know, what's going to happen to the town of Thibodeau? I said, you've been down the bayou lately. They said, you got land right next to the, the bayou, and then off to the side, what do you have? I said, you know, if this doesn't stop, I could foreseeably see this happening to Thibodeau. You know, it's not that very far um, to get down there and see that. So I think they, when they started thinking about it that way, they realized that, my God, this is my home, and this could happen, and how will that change? What am I going to bring my kids back to to visit, visit Grandma and Grandpa? What is it going to be like uh, when I get back? Um, 
I think it made a profound impact upon them. So these stories will be there forever, even maybe after we've washed away. There will at least be a story there about who we were and what we were about. That's important. It makes me think of the kids and them say, wait, we can't just, like, they can't just get rid of us, you know? And they really started to put their hearts into what they were doing after they heard the interviews. And it meant something to them. So before it was, this is where we live, you know, let's just, this is where we live. They hadn't thought any more beyond that because they thought it would be here forever. And now that they know what could happen and what has happened, just with the histories that we've heard, it's like, y'all, y'all have to wake up. We've got to do something. So if nothing else, I, I woke three little people up and they got to hear it for themselves firsthand and be responsible for collecting the primary data and having it housed so one day someone can hear it that might not have the advantage of being here. stay for economic reasons and uh, and cultural reasons a working coast. The Acadians were the first uh, people in North America to use wetlands to manage wetlands to grow crop. They would grow um, they, was, they would grow um, uh, salt marsh hay which was um, which was highly desirable in the American colonies to feed draft animals in the major cities. They would, uh, they would build a dike in the tidal areas, hollow out a pipe, uh, a tree, and make a, a wooden pipe out of it, stick it in the levees, build over, and it was called an aborto. And it's, it, that, was the, um, that was the forefather to the modern day flumes. They could let seawater in to fertilize, and they could cut it off, and then let it rain, and then drain it and, and, and grow hay. And then they, they would drain it all the way down to cut it and cure the hay and then store it. So <clears throat> that is the reason why the English wanted the Acadian land so bad. They wanted those hay fields. The land that's eroding is our estuaries. That's where our juvenile fish and shrimp and things like that come to grow up. If that is not there, they don't have as much area to come grow up. So we won't have that many fish, shrimp, crabs, whatever. So for the seafood, commercial seafood industry, uh, if there's not the amount of seafood to be caught, uh, either the seafood industry is going to go downhill or thing, the seafood will cost so much for the consumer to buy that they won't be able to afford it uh, what, the, what the fishermen do catch. So it could potentially have some pretty bad uh, effects on crawfish, you know, like I say, crabs. The only thing that's thriving is oysters uh, because it's not land, it's water, and they grow in, in the water like that, you know. Uh, fur trade, alligators. They like trapping down, alligators trapping. will disappear because they don't really live in yeah. a saltwater area much, so. Of course, Nutra, muskrat, we haven't seen muskrats in years. Yeah. All, of, all of that stuff that lives on the marsh, on certain types of marsh, if they live in a saltwater marsh, there's, they're not there anymore. And I guess, thinking about it, you could actually count 
as far as even duck hunting. Yeah, you know, even if the, the ducks don't live here, and they, they migrate down here, if there's no marsh, potholes, or, you know, where the, the ducks are going to come land, no feed, yeah, we'll they're not going to stay here. Therefore, the duck hunters are not going to be spending the money to go duck hunting. So, and it's gas, shells, you know, P-rogs, camouflage clothes. Could, you know, if there's no place to go, people aren't going to do it. They're not going to be spending that money. So, economically, it could have far-reaching uh, effects of not having the land that we should have. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to, or well, we're not doing an effective job of saving. Lord, man, we used to hunt ducks. I'd get up in the morning and go make a duck hunt and come back with four and five sacks full of ducks. Big mallets, gray ducks, teals, uh, pintails, canvas bag, uh, you name it, we'd kill it. I mean, and it was all food that we'd put on the table, you know, it, it, nothing was wasted. We, we, hunting changed a lot. We used to have a lot of ducks, a lot of ducks and a lot of geese in the, uh, in the marshes in our area down here. And, even the ducks that we don't have them. The last 20 years, uh, the ducks and the geese just don't come down. I don't know why they don't migrate down here anymore. Do you like to eat? I try the crabs and fish, <laughs> oysters, and all those other good things. Because uh, you know, between 30 and 40 percent of the nation's seafood comes from our wetlands and 40% uh, of the endangered species that we have in our country live right here. In addition to that, we have one of the largest ports in the world, so a lot of the goods and services that are shipped or, or exported or imported into our country come through our port, and that port, the infrastructure of that port is supported by our wetlands. Without the wetlands, we don't have that. We don't have good seafood to eat, and uh, people north of us don't get heating oil to heat their homes or gasoline to drive their cars. So there's a real fine balance. We need to find the balance between working in the wetlands and keeping them as storm surge protection or nursery ground and, or all the other functions that they serve.
Let Papa tell you. Things change, bro. It's unreal. People change. Times have changed a lot since the time I was a kid. Our coastline along the Gulf here is probably 10 foot a year of, um, that we lose. Um, some places, uh, the average is probably 10 foot because in the area around Southwest Pass where the, there's no beachhead left, uh, and in Chinyatig where they have a uh, beachhead, that is slower at Chinyatig than it is around the pass because there's nothing to hold a marsh around the pass. There's no beachhead. I can I can go and show you where they had uh, a camp, and now the pilings that a camp are on are in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, you can you can visually see it. There are oak trees that were that were alive just a few years ago. that are now just a, a skeleton on right on the edge of the salt water that's getting ready to fall in. I mean, yeah, you can see it. When I was younger, Cameron Parish had a whole lot more trees, and the and the Gulf was far out there. It's very close now. The erosion is amazing. I mean, I can remember when you used to have to drive for 20 minutes to get to Rutherford Beach. Now you don't have to drive very far. Um, a lot of trees have died since Rita and Ike, and um, a lot of marsh grass also. There used to be a lot of roseau cane, and there's not as much as it, there was. I know the marsh is more, like you can, it's closer to the ridges than it used to be. Um, and it's it's just mud now, it's not even marsh, there's not grass in it, it's just nothing but mud because of salt water intrusion and erosion. It just makes you have a little bit of concern in the back of your mind, you know, is where will it ever stop? Um, at some point, will it erode away and, and break into large pieces of land and, and the river just take a whole new path? You know, could it come through uh, downtown Lutcha or Garyville? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the towns that this would greatly affect. Um, it, would, it, it would come right through the city and then, you know, once, once it comes through there, it's going to come on through to, to erode and erode and erode and, you know, where it'll stop, who knows? It could make a whole new path of the river. We used to go to quite a few places. On Blue Point, we used to trap a lot of fur animals, that uh, neutral rats and muskrat and otters and minks. And 95% uh, of Blue Point is gone compared to when I was a kid. And we got a place called Point Mizad, which is an island, dead Cypress Point on the map, matter of fact. And uh, we used to go camping on that little island and seen for fish and catch fish just to eat and stuff like that. And the island is completely gone. And as far as coastal erosion, I've seen thousands and thousands of acres of land wash away since I was a kid. Yeah, I guess it was probably three years ago I had the opportunity to do my first flyover and it really, really hits home. It's, it, was, it was very, very sad. The first one that I, that I was um, able to do was a Plaquemines Parish. And when you're up in the air and you know what used to be marsh that isn't there anymore, you know, you can see how much open water there is. Um, the, the problem just, you know, hits you in the face. 
And uh, when you look from the air at some of the projects that cost billions of dollars, um, you just kind of look down and go, that's it? You know, if they, they, you know, are such large projects on paper, um, but when you see them from the air, they're, they're, you know, just a drop in the bucket. And, and knowing that we're not even at a no net loss for, for wetland loss, it's pretty, it's pretty scary. And then twice I've also had the opportunity to do uh, flyovers of uh, Terrebonne uh, Bay and um, that is in, in, in very sad shape too, and realizing that miles and miles of marsh that used to protect us from storm surge and was a nursery ground for all the critters that we like to eat and others, um, it's just gone. Yeah. And uh, I think probably one of the most impactful things was seeing Il de Jean Charles from the air and realizing that there's miles and miles of road with just open water on both sides and then you can't even really call it a sliver of land where this community of Native Americans lives. It's just kind of a, a bump and you know the ne next hurricane that comes along it's going into water and we'll probably have to move further and further north. One of the things that they found after Katrina were these loosely formed marsh balls. This one is actually a marsh ball from Hurricane Betsy, which was uh, in 1965. Some of them weigh 100 pounds, this one weighs four. Um, it's very, very densely compacted marsh grass. And it got this way by A, first being unhealthy, and then uh, the wind and the wave action from Hurricane Betsy caused it to the, the grass to break up and compact into these balls. If we had healthy marsh, this wouldn't happen. The marsh is unhealthy to begin with, so it's easily broken up and compacted or inverted. Um, the sediment is also taken up along with the marsh grass, um, and then when those big rolls or balls like this land on top of other marsh, you know, when the storm is over, the sediment drops out and kills whatever healthy marsh it's sitting on top of also. Salt water got a hold of all the marsh vegetation and killed the marsh vegetation. The roots of all these plants is what holds all of that mud together. Well, once you, you don't have that uh, plant structure to hold on to the mud, it's much easier for when these surges of water comes in and it just washes away the mud much easier. I've seen uh, what happened after Hurricane Rita and Ike to our communities along the coast here. Um, went from thriving communities to, uh, I was a little bit young when Audrey hit, Hurricane Audrey, which was the, the worst one before that. I see, I see um, the communities are going to struggle, and if we can go through a period of 40 or 50 years with no major storms, uh, some of those communities may rebuild slightly. But I don't think they will ever be like they were because of government regulations. You it, you have to do certain. You have to build a certain height. You have to get a certain type of insurance, and it's just not worth it anymore. So I think some of the communities will will some of them may come back a bit because of the fishing and the industry, but they will never be thriving communities like they were before. So I think it's really it's really sad. I mean, you can't take the risk anymore. It's a community that has died for at least a period of time and is trying to resurrect itself, but with all these new laws, it's not really able to function or grow like it would had the laws not been enacted. And I understand them because I, with coastal problems and the shrinking of the coast and the sea, le uh, sea level rising and the climate changes and I can see what's written on the wall and what's yet to come, but how do you just give up on everything that you've been and everything that you dreamed of? With all the hurricanes we've had and everything else, that there, there has been problems. 
However, you know what happens with the with the disappearance of the coast when you build levees, you are protected, but you're putting somebody else in danger. Uh, and I can give you a, just the latest when Hurricane Isaac hit. All right, New Orleans was protected by the levees and everything they did. The people in Laplace got the worst. They were the ones who were flooded. Okay. Well. We evacuated many times in the past. And we'd always come back, nothing happened. And it really comes in. It changed, it changed everybody's life down here. Uh, I'd say probably 95% of the people in Cameron Parish all report lost their homes. Uh, we come back. I try to come back. Uh, it changed the lives for our kids. We couldn't provide. It was hard to get started again. It's like you know, you, you work all your life, and then you lose it all in one time. If anybody thinks that we don't affect our climate, something's wrong. I just don't know. It depends upon what time frame you look at these different events. If you look at these events in the big picture, then they're a little bit easier to understand than if you look at it from a five year period. Of course, man is only concerned about, you know, five-year periods or ten-year periods or one lifetime. The causality of these changes, whether they be slow, um, rapid, or, or, or imperceivable, always comes from some other factor. In the case of climate change, um, the handwriting is, the is on the wall and, and we've got ample documentation that uh, man him or herself has has um, accelerated the the uh, conditions that lead to climate change. With the melting of the ice caps, it's a very foreboding scenario that's coming at us. The fact that we've lost 1,900 square miles of our state usually just blows people away, especially since it's been in the last, um, you know, 80, 90 years since 1932. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, try to get them to think about what, what's so important about that date and how the 1927 flood sort of spurred on the, the formation of the Army Corps of Engineers when levying and harnessing the river became commonplace. And that's really the, the, the biggest reason that we have well of loss is because we no longer let the river follow its natural course and change over time like it used to, to build more land with different lobes. And um, we've levied and dammed it so far up and down that only half of the sediment that historically came down the river now comes down the river and that sediment um, goes down to the mouth of the river and down several thousand feet off the edge of the continental shelf because we've dammed and levied and jetty that's so far down so it's a little hard to build wetlands from that far down. So that's our, our biggest biggest problem and then we've cut lumber canals and gas and oil canals and shipping channels like Mr. Go. Um, which helps exacerbate not only the problem of wetland loss because of saltwater intrusion, but sometimes creates uh, optimal conditions for storm surge to come through too. We have, we have channelized the coast of our part of the coast, and I cannot speak for any other part of Louisiana but our coast. Uh, we have put navigational channels in that have completely changed the hydrology 
and it, and it has allowed um, saltwater intrusion and tidal flux to get into the interior of Mars where it never was before. So we, we went from a very um, solid base in our marsh to now where it's very fragmented and it's, and it's going to open water, even the interior is going to open water. And it's, it's, it's evident when you look at land loss maps since um, 1969 when freshwater bio was, was, was installed to today, it has accelerated tremendously, our marsh loss has accelerated tremendously. Why did we dig uh, uh, Mr. Go in, in New Orleans, the Human Navigational Channel, Freshwater Bayou, and the Calcasieu Navigational Channel? It was access from from the fast lands of Louisiana where you could put industry to the Gulf of Mexico. The old natural streams that could not support uh, large large vessels, only the navigational channels could. You know, uh, there have been test pro projects all over the place. Um, there was a really large test project that was done in the Lake Pontchartrain area. Um, I believe it's called the Maripaw Marsh Project, where they pumped in uh, a couple of square miles, maybe five square miles of mud, and uh, you know, added some vegetation, and waited to see how long it would take to come around, and you know be vital and uh, I would say that project is about 20 years old now and not only is it vital it's a beautiful area um, it was uh, a contained area by uh, rock and PVC pipe walls and then the mud was pumped in and then natural vegetation was planted on the island and then the rest of the vegetation took on on its own and uh, it was a very good project, you know, and something like that could be done in different parts of, of uh, the coast where bringing large boulders, large rocks, and then backfill with mud, you know, all this mud's free. It costs money to pump it, you know, you need, you need a, a, a large dredge to pump it, but the mud is free. You're pumping the mud off the bottom. The mud didn't just disappear, it's just been washed out and spread out into the water area. All that mud is still there. It can be retained and pumped back in, and those lands can be put back together again. You know, but all this stuff costs money. Where does the money come from? I think that most of our citizens are unaware of the true magnitude of the well and loss issue in Louisiana. You know, I don't know if the rest of the country truly sees the real problem. They don't live anywhere near the river. But what they don't realize is the river feeds the whole United States in and out. Um, some of the biggest chemical plants, um, grain, anything that you can find in a Walmart store, Best Buy store, it all, almost all comes under the Mississippi River on container ships. I've been around people all over the country. Um, you know, some people come in here for uh, conventions and, um, you know, different things of this nature who haven't been around it enough, who don't really have any skin in the game, as you would say, and uh, are really, I'm going to call it illiterate to the, what the real problems are. You know, they don't understand that, you know, one day all of this stuff could be gone, you know, and they don't realize that the clothes that are on their back, you know, the shoes that they're wearing, the laptop computer that they're using, how's all that stuff going to get here if there's no more river, if there's no more influx of commodities? Yeah. You know, how are you going to get it? I loved the way that I was brought up. Uh, we all knew our neighbors. And then another thing I remember that I used to like, they used to call it veille, which means to stay up late at night. The adults would come to our house, you know, the adults would come, the women would sit on the porch, 
the men would go out on the, on the side of the road where there was a cattle guard and a gate, and they used to they used to have that tete a tete there. The men would get together, the women on our porch, and the children were playing hide and seek with one another. And I think that that was a lot of fun because uh, sometimes you could overhear some of the adult conversations, you know. And I remember the men in particular. They used to have a little band, and this is what the band consisted of: a washboard. And one man could play the trumpet using his hands. I don't know how he did it, but you could hear them singing, you know, doing their music together. So I think we, the way we were brought up, enabled us to become creative. You know. It is very difficult down here, and we will be moving from Cameron as soon as my daughter's out of school because we can't afford to live here no more. Our government, our local government, has hurt us by not helping us. I want to come back, I want to stay here. I just can't afford to to go by county regulations to build anymore. I, 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 and, I, and this is the parish I grew up in that I loved so much at one time. It's extremely hard to get established along coastal Louisiana because of the cost. But it can be done, um, but you have to want it. You have to want to do it. And, and, and as in the French language, um, most of the Marsh culture is lost. The trapping is lost. That culture is lost. Shrimping is in tr big trouble. And they're importing shrimp from Brazil and, and everywhere else, so the, the, their prices are, are, are depressed. Um, so you have a few things that you could make a living off of in coastal Louisiana, but not many. It's, it, those opportunities are dwindling rapidly. You know, it's, there are no more opportunities. It's just too expensive to live here. One day, you know, before you blink, it's going to be over with. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there are a lot of projects that are very proactive towards it, but there are a lot of people out there who are against it all, saying that it's a waste of money. Um, you know, so many people who were in other parts of the country post-Katrina, you know, why keep spending money on a place that's just going to wash away? You know, um, blighted community, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, there's a lot more to the bigger picture. In the natural world, the Louisiana wetlands are the most productive system in the world. The Amazon is, I mean, you see a lot of biodiversity there, but if you cut the trees down, you can't even, you can grow crops for three or four years and it, it, it loses its, its fertility. I don't care where you go, this, this environment is the most for total biomass, plant and animal material in the world. Community's gotten a lot smaller, but uh, as for people-wise, we I think we care about each other a whole lot more because we've been through a lot together. And everybody still knows everybody, and everybody asks how your mom and daddy doing, and how's your grandma and grandpa, and just just how your family's been. So the community really hasn't changed all that much. It's just gotten closer. It's, it's, it's not a simple place, it's a complex place. Home, home is family. Um, and those traditions and cultures that go along with your family. It's a very beautiful 
beautiful place. There's no place like it. <laughs> you can ask other people. This is a place all in its own. The people are all, <laughs> they're, they're not what you would expect out of other people. Everything here is different. It works its own way. And a very lively community that just takes care of itself. It doesn't need, on a normal basis, you know, help. Because they're just fighters. They're survivors. What's happening is that the place, what they call it, estuaries, where these fish breed and grow up, what people don't realize, crabs and that shrimp does not breed in Lake Pontchartrain. They might mate, but they have to go offshore to salt water. And that's where they hatch the eggs. And then they come into the marsh, into the estuaries, and that's where they grow up at. And then when they get a certain size, then they move into the lakes and that. And then they move back out to the Gulf again. But, uh, but the lagoons and all of that are, are nothing but salt water and polluted and everything else now. Now the commercial fishermen, very few of them make a living in Lake Pontchartrain. The only certain time of the year, and then they have to get up and move. They have to go fish the Gulf, go fish Bretton Sound, the Chandeliers, Grand Isle. At one time, you used to could live right here in Little Woods and fish year-round and make a living and raise your family. You can't do that no more. Hey, that's somebody that's been around the lake 69 years, been fishing and tramping all his life, and my battery's running low, so I gotta turn it off. <laughs>